First class I took as a young 22-year-old seminary student at Fuller Seminary was a course called Foundation for Ministry. The class, I was, so I, was, I was 24 years old, I'm in my first semester there trying to take in the, the place and just the atmosphere at, uh, at Fuller. The first class was, was the brainchild of Bob Munger. Bob Munger for many years had been the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Berkeley, uh, an evangelical powerhouse uh, at that time. Um, he was a longtime friend and associate of, of Billy Graham from their early days together. His printed sermon, you may be familiar with, My, My Heart, Christ Home, if you've ever seen that, which he preached on a just, it was just an ordinary Sunday evening service uh, at First Press that he preached that sermon and everybody that was there knew that something unusual had happened and that sermon got printed and at last count, I think it sold over 11 million copies still in print from InterVarsity. He came to Fuller in his later years, in his latter years, as the professor of evangelism and church renewal, and this was his dream course. It was his vision. To lay a foundation and set a course for a lifetime of faithful ministry on which the remainder of our three or four years there could be built upon. With a, with a view or a vision toward ministry. That was, his, that was his dream. And I think it achieved that. It, uh, so that throughout the remainder of your curriculum, Greek, Hebrew, systematic theology, church history, Old New Testament, biblical theology, all of those things would, would, be, would, would be seen with a vision toward that end. That was his, that was his desire. Munger lectured about a third of the time. The other two-thirds were guest lectures from all over the world, but mostly from this country, some of the most well-known Christian leaders of the time. Most of them were at the very height of their ministries, were, were wise, seasoned, experienced, godly. I looked at it almost as sort of a greatest generation of people. It was there that I was first introduced to Ray Steadman, first learned of him. Uh, Bob and he were great friends, and Ray came down for the better part of a week, brought a group of pastors from Peninsula Bible Church, and we sat uh, enthralled at what they had to say and share. I think all of them who came and spoke, and I could give you a list of who's who's, felt the weight of the opportunity and gave us the very best that they had and the most important that they could possibly give. It was an unbelievable experience and life-changing and in many ways life-altering, as you can imagine. I'll never forget one of those days Munger was speaking, and uh, he seemed uh, unusually uninhibited. Almost as easy, he was a, he was a patrician, stately guy, but full of... Uh, a passion and vigor, a huge mane of silver hair, dignified, always in a, you know, impeccable coat and tie, and just a gentleman of gentlemen. But he seemed unusually animated and free on that given day, almost as if he had had a, a few drinks. And it took us a bit by, by, by surprise, but he, uh, he was sharing from the depths of his soul. We were about 35 minutes in there, complete silence. This was a very large lecture hall packed. Uh, when Gary Demarest, who was also a professor at Fuller and a product of Bob Munger's ministry when he was a student at Cal, had come to Christ through that church and under his ministry and now was teaching there and was going to take this course. This was the last time Munger was approaching 70. I had the privilege of being in the last time he taught this course. Just got under the, got under the wire. So Gary Demarest was going to take over the course and continue it for him. And about 35 minutes in, he steps up and he, he whispers something in Bob Munger's ear and he escorts him back over to the front row and he sets him down and somebody brings him a glass, a glass of juice and a couple of cookies. Well, come to find out, he's a lifelong diabetic. Lifelong diabetic. 
but he took meticulous care of himself, lived to age 90, which is unusual for a, for a lifelong diabetic. But on that particular occasion, his blood sugar got low, and he became <laughs> uh, uninhibited, transparent, and uh, so they, 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 they got him, everyone was kind of just waiting to see what happened. They got him kind of stabilized, and then they took him out of the room to take him to some place to lie down and just kind of recover a bit. And then Gary Demers got up and he said, you know, I, I have to tell you, I didn't know what to do. Because he said, I knew what was happening. But he said, I also knew that we were given the precious gift of 35 minutes of him sharing from his soul uninhibited. That was coming from the depths of his being. And so on one hand, I, I didn't want to stop him. On the other hand, I didn't want to let him go until he collapsed. And so when he saw that kind of sweet moment, when he could intervene in that moment and whisper in his ear and bring him and set him down, but we had that precious gift. I thought of that uh, experience when I was reading over this passage in the atmosphere that I think it encompasses. This group of relatively young probably most of them relatively young and inexperienced Christian leaders, all ears, and Paul, knowing that his last opportunity to personally speak to them again, this side of heaven, and that the work of the gospel in that major part of the world, which was critical to, to the advancement of the gospel, would largely now rest in their hands. From Troas, Paul's team began their many legs, the many legs of their voyage that would eventually bring them to Caesarea, from which they would make the overland journey up to Jerusalem. Luke tells us that Paul had made a conscious decision to sail past Ephesus. That may seem surprising that he would do that, given the importance of that church and that work. But he, was, he concluded that he could not make a visit there and still get to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, which he was determined to do. He couldn't both visit the congregation and have the exclusive time that he needed with the pastoral leadership, not only of the, the city, but of the area. And so he made a strategic decision to call for the pastoral leadership of the church to meet him at the port of Miletus as they, as they came in there for the night, which was about 30 miles from Ephesus, a port city on the Meander River. And so they all came to him. It was part reunion, part farewell, deeply formed friendships and colleagues. It was a poignant scene. Paul's address falls into two distinct parts. In the first part, verses 18 through 27, he gives uh, a solemn accounting of his own life and ministry, lays it out before them. In the second part, verses 28 through 35, he gives a solemn charge regarding their life and ministry. So that's where the turn takes place in the address. He begins by laying before them the, entire, the entirety of his life and ministry, the entire time that he was with them. He begins in verse 18, um, you know how I lived? the whole time that I was with you, from the first day that I came into the province of Asia. This is what characterized his life and ministry. Verse 19, I served the Lord. Just pause on those words before we go on. I served the Lord. Those four simple words encapsulated the whole of his life and ministry. Ministry is service. It's a call to serve. It is serving others. Jesus had made that unmistakably clear, hadn't he, on the night before his arrest when he took off his outer clothes and wrapped himself in a towel and stooped down to wash the feet of each one of those disciples. That what would characterize his calling upon them and their life and their ministry was to be a servant. That's all. I remember Bob Munger one day in class saying to us, there are two things that you need to remember and never forget, he said. Never forget. Wherever God calls you, wherever you go, whatever congregation you end up, he said, 
He said, number one, you go to serve those people. Never forget that. You go there to serve them, not to lead them. There's a servant, there's a leadership aspect of serving, but you go there to serve them. That's who you are. Never forget that. The second thing he said, and it's equally important, he, he underscored this, never forget this. They are not your master. They are not your master. He is your master. You serve him by serving them with an eye to him. What they want you to do is not of paramount importance. What of paramount importance, what does he want you to do? What is of paramount importance is not what they think about you, but what he thinks about you. You serve them, but only with an eye to him. Now, four specific things that he underscored characterized that service. These are the words he uses. Great humility, tears, severe testing, and then I would summarize the, the, the last one, incessant pastoral care through preaching and teaching, both corporate and personal. This is what he says, verse 19. I served the Lord with great humility, with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of the Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. By great humility, he meant a lack of interest or concern for himself and his own future, his own privilege, his own reward. He had no, no, that, was, that did not factor importantly into his life. What other humility? By tears, he meant his deep and genuine concern for others in spite of significant hardship and suffering. He preached and taught everything, everywhere, to everyone, completely. Anything that would be helpful, publicly and from house to house, Jews and Greeks, repentance and faith. Corporately, their gatherings, the lecture halls, their corporate worship, personal visitation, individual counseling, congregation, one-on-one, -on -one, as did Jesus, the shepherd of shepherds. Who preached to the multitudes, who taught the band of disciples, who counseled individuals. Ensuring that they truly knew him and truly continued to walk with him. Repentance and faith, nothing less. Philip Brooks, the great um, preacher and bishop of Boston back in the late 1800s, if you go to that church today in the center of Boston, Holy Trinity Church, there's a huge statue out front with Philip Brooks in a pulpit with a Bible open before him, and it says, Philip Brooks, preacher of the word says. What a great legacy. Brooks wrote uh, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem, if you know that. He wrote a book on preaching that's considered one of the standards uh, of all time. It was lectures that he gave at Yale back in the late 1800s, and he said these, these important words. He said, the preacher must be a pastor lest he grow remote. The pastor must be a preacher in order to maintain the dignity of his office. The preacher must be a pastor, lest he grow remote. The pastor must be a preacher to maintain the dignity of, of, the, of his office. And then Brooks said, that is the tension in which I live. 
I can't be long in my study without seeing the faces of my people coming before me, calling for my care and attention. And I can't be long with my people individually without feeling the tug of my study calling me to pray and prepare. You know how I lived the whole time that I was with you. In humility and tears, amid much testings and hardships, how I didn't hesitate, I didn't hold back to proclaim anything to you that was profitable publicly or from house to house, individually, privately, Jew, Gentile, faith, repentance. He then explained the reason for his departure. So he lays before them what they knew, what they had seen, and then he explains the reason for his departure. Verse 22. And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. He wasn't leaving them or abandoning them for a better opportunity or greener pastures or for a higher position or a better place or better pay. This wasn't a matter of personal ambition. It wasn't a matter of a growth opportunity. There are three truths that he underscores about his departure. First of all, it was divine necessity. He was compelled by the Spirit or constrained. He had no choice in the, except the, the choice to obey. It was God's will. And it was important for them to know that and to share that conviction with them. It was filled with personal uncertainty, even though it was clearly a divine necessity and call, it was filled with personal uncertainty, not knowing, he said, what will happen to me there. The only thing that he knew for certain was that the Holy Spirit had warned him from this point on, prison and hardship would be his lot, wherever he went. By everything we know, that's exactly the case. Tradition is that he was released from his Roman imprisonment where the book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome. Tradition is that he was released for a brief period of time, that he made his trip to Spain, which had been his ambition. And tradition holds that he may have even gone as far as Great Britain before owing to Persecution, the Roman persecution of Christians. He was rearrested again, brought back to Rome, in which case at that time he was placed in a dungeon in chains, no longer in an apartment of his own uh, purchase, but in a Roman dungeon from where he writes the second letter of Timothy prior to his martyrdom. So when he said that he was had been told by the Holy Spirit that this would be the character or tenor or situation of his life, that is exactly what unfolded. But it was void of any personal consideration that didn't factor into his perspective or his decision. It was God's compulsion, the Spirit compelled it was uncertain. It was certain that it would be hardship in prison. But I want you to know, he's saying this to them, that I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given to me. His personal status, his personal comfort were of no consideration in that decision. My life, nothing, he wrote. His only singular ambition and aim was to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus had given him. 
period. That was the only thing that mattered. To which he adds one other thing. Because all of this was true, he continues in verse 25, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. That was the one thing that was the most difficult for them to accept of everything that Paul said. They didn't want to hear that last one. Which brought him to an unusual and solemn declaration in verse 26 and 27. I know that none of you among whom I've gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. You may recognize that language. It's the language of Ezekiel 33, the truth that God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel about the watchman. If the watchman sees the sword coming against the land and if he blows the horn to warn the inhabitants of the land and they refuse to listen to the warning, then their blood is on themselves, not on the watchman. He sounded the he sounded the warning. But if the sword comes or threatens and he doesn't blow the horn and people are not warned, then the blood of those people is on him, on the watchman. God, of course, applied that directly to the call and ministry of Ezekiel and Paul takes that same truth upon himself. We're responsible for the souls for whom we're responsible. <laughs> we're responsible for the souls for whom we are responsible. There's no getting way around, around that. There's no other way to read it. Their blood, blood will be on us or it will not. And what determines that is whether we sound the horn, sound the warning. We're responsible for the souls of those for whom we are responsible. We are not responsible for their response. We are responsible for their opportunity to respond. But notice importantly what the criteria is for that opportunity, what it meant from Paul's perspective to sound the horn. Paul's basis for proclaiming his innocence, that he was, that he was innocent of the blood of all of them, was that he had proclaimed the whole will or the whole purpose of God. Those are the words he uses. The whole will, the whole counsel, or the whole purpose of God. Not just what was popular, not what was just palatable, not just what they wanted to hear. God's entire plan and will. Fully, accurately, clearly, deeply, passionately, incessantly, without fear or favor. I did not hesitate. He repeats that phrase twice in his address, meaning to hold back or to shrink back. For three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. That's why he could proclaim his innocence. Everywhere to everyone, who came within his sphere of influence or his sphere of, conf of, of uh, within his severe sphere of contact. He had been faithful in making known the whole will or purpose of God. And now the task would fall to them, his solemn charge to them. The charge was simply this, be good shepherds of God's flock. Verse 27. I'm sorry, verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock 
of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. That's the charge. Be good shepherds of God's flock. A shepherd has one responsibility and one responsibility alone, and that is the well-being of the sheep. Of each and every sheep. To feed, to take to pasture, to nurture, to protect, to nurse from illness or injury, to rescue from harm or loss. Everything a shepherd does is to that end. Everything. Nothing matters in comparison to that essential duty. Nothing else competes for that. Nothing else gets in the way of that. It is his single sole ambition and responsibility, the care and well-being of the sheep, each and every one. And here's the kicker. The sheep are not his own. They belong to another. The owner of the sheep entrusts the shepherd with the care of his sheep which he purchased. So there must be a deep sense of trust and stewardship between the owner and the shepherd. In our case, the owner is God. His spirit appoints us and entrusts us to watch over those whom he has purchased with his blood, as Paul says. In order to do that, in order to be a good shepherd, the shepherd must tend himself. Paul says, keep watch first over yourselves to the shepherds. To be a good shepherd, he must guard his own heart. He must ensure that his or her motives are right. That his or her ambitions are pure. That his or her methods are to that end and that end alone. That the sheep are not just assets to be used for my ambitions and purpose. That he's not a thief or hireling. And that's the fundamental distinction between a true shepherd and a false shepherd. Whether his object is the care of the sheep or whether his object is really himself at the expense of the well-being of the sheep. So a good shepherd must first maintain his own heart in his own spiritual life. Watch over yourselves if he's going to be a good shepherd. And that requires vigilance. That requires devotion. That requires time away, as our Lord did, <laughs> repeatedly, frequently. That requires accountability. That requires others who we invite into our life to help us understand blind spots and see blind spots or areas of deficiency in our character. <clears throat> Watch yourselves, Paul says. And then guard the sheep. And it is not neutral territory. There are predators, wolves, whose ambitions are their own goals, appetites, agendas, and often they are right among us, as Paul says. We must always, always be vig vigilant. And with that, he handed over to them the work. Committing them to the word of God and the God of the word. Verse 32, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, 
which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That was the passing of the baton. (laughs) You know my life. You've seen the way I lived. You've seen who I was. You've seen how I lived. You've seen what I've given myself to. It all lays before you. And now I give you the charge to be good shepherds, to watch the flock that the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of, that he himself purchased with his own blood. I give you that charge. And now I commend you to him. I'm handing you the the reins, the responsibilities as I leave. With one final addendum, almost uh, Samuel-like, if you remember the, the story of Samuel, who in the end, before he leaves the scene, can say very similar words to Paul's final words to them in verse 33. He says, I I commit you to God, to the word of his grace that can build you up, give you an inheritance. And then he says these words. I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So as he hands the baton or he hands over the reins to them, he wants to make a solemn declaration and affirmation. There's nothing for him to pay back. He hasn't taken anything from them. (laughs) That was the gist of Samuel's words to the Israelites. There was nothing I need to restore to you. That's what Paul was saying. It's interesting that in those in that statement we realize that Paul in his ministry at Ephesus for those three years would indicate by those words that he had taken no remuneration for his work. We sometimes think because in the in the uh, flow of Acts we remember when Paul comes to Corinth and he's making tents with Priscilla and Aquila and then an offering comes from Macedonia and we're told remember at Corinth that Paul was able to not make tents and devote himself fully to the ministry there, that that was continuous and ongoing. But the indication, it was not. It came at times. There were times when gifts came that allowed him to be free. But he says very clearly right here, in regard to the three years that he was at Ephesus, you yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. He was absolutely clear, crystal clear, about his right to get remuneration for his work of the gospel. But he didn't cling to that right. He didn't insist upon that right. He didn't demand that right. And in fact, in many cases and instances, and including at Ephesus, he thought it was advantageous to not exercise that right so that he could model to others this incredibly important ingredient to all ministry, and that is the freedom or the um, the lack of covetousness or greed. Peter writes um, in his last word, to Christian leaders, He says, I appeal to you as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock, shepherds of God's flock, that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. And then these words, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not driven by material aspiration or ambition and so Paul in order to model that to the those who would follow waived that right labored with his hands in order to support himself
And I don't know whether you've paid attention to this phrase. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, he said. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus that it is more blessed to give than to receive. I I had a moment of self-pity this week. And I don't don't have many of them. Generally, I don't take credit for that. I just, not the way I'm wired, not the way God made me. So they're, they're, they, they tend to be few and far between. They tend to not last for long, those moments of self-pity, but they are profoundly deep, <laughs> profoundly deep. And I had a moment of self-pity this week. And the heart of that self-pity was, you know, I'm, I'm tired of being strong. I'm tired of caring for the weak. I got too many weak that I'm caring for. And I'm ready for somebody else to be strong. I want to be weak for a little while. I want to have somebody take care of me. Those kind of thoughts. Patricia can tell you the truth of this. I went off after we had coffee that morning. I'm in my study and I'm reading over this passage. And it's so amazing to me how you can read a passage of scripture and read a verse that you've read. Count. I can't tell you how many times I've read this verse. And I, I came to this verse. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. Man, it was like a two by four. Bam! I came out to church. I said, man, I just got a two by four between my eyes. Because she'd sat there earlier and listened to my woes. You know, we're both the oldest. And it just has felt like all of our life that we've been the ones that are responsible for everything. Everyone and everything. And if you've ever experienced that or ever had that kind of moment of self-pity, you know what I'm talking about. Those times when you just say, I'm just, I'm going to sell this house and I'm going to go get an apartment in Truckee and (laughs) they'll have to drive at least two hours to see me. Or ask for anything from me. (laughs) And then I read Paul's words. In everything I showed you by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak. And you know what? They are weaker. I'm stronger. I hit the road, road running. I was out the door at 17 and a half. Man, I never looked back. So for me, that's just the way I'm wired. And it took a lot of hard work on the Lord's part to help me to realize that whatever that is, whatever he's given to the both of us is a grace from him. Not for our benefit, not to pat our feather our nest and tell everybody else, go get yours. But to recognize that all of those abilities and all of those opportunities that he's given to us and all of the advantages and all of the... uh, all that we've done to take advantage of those advantages were for the purpose of having to be able to be his hand and caring for those who, for whatever reason, (laughs) didn't have that. Or upbringing, wiring, who they are. When Paul finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them, and he prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed. What grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. But I guarantee you that as vividly as I can remember that class with Bob Munger on low blood sugar, they never forgot that, that gathering and that scene and those words. And they pass them on to others. Richard Baxter, the great Puritan, great English Puritan, in his classic 
book, The Reformed Pastor, um, wrote words that, that, that most believe were right out of Acts chapter 20. That's what influenced what he wrote. But he wrote this. He said, oh, then let us hear these arguments of Christ when we feel ourselves grow dull and careless. Or I would add, self-pity. Did I die for them? And will you not look after them? Were they worth my blood? And are they not worth your labor? Did I come down from heaven to earth to seek and to save that which was lost? And will thou now go to the next door or street or village to seek them? How small is thy labor and condescension compared to mine? I debased myself to do this, but it is your honor to be so employed. Have I done and suffered so much for their salvation, and was I willing to make thee a co-worker with me? And wilt thou refuse the little that lieth upon thy hands? That was Paul's word to these young Christian leaders. Let me just say that before we pray together that it's not a word just for shepherds. It is a word supremely for shepherds, but not just for shepherds. Because all of us are called to care for, for sheep as well. Some are given principal re responsibility, but we're all responsible for, for caring for each other as well. And for the souls that God has put into the sphere of our life to pray and to make sure that we can say with Paul in the end, I've, I'm innocent of the blood. I've not hesitated. I've not held back in declaring anything that was profitable and have declared the whole purpose and will of God. Can't, can't determine the response, but I can determine my faithfulness and ensuring that. Let's pray together. So, dear Father, here we are, as is so often the case, back at this, this place of recognizing our own propensity toward self-concern and selfishness personal ambition, personal concern, rather than your work. Thank you for this really amazing occasion when, when these whom Paul had, had really developed such deep abiding bonds of friendship gathered together in the recognition that this was this was their farewell they wouldn't they wouldn't see each other again but they would live from that day forward with a vivid memory of those important words which Paul in in utter humility shared with them so that they might know the depths of his heart and the depths of his motivation, might breathe in something of his life and character, be ennobled by it, be challenged by it, be strengthened by it. 
and so may we. Thank you for each of these who labor faithfully in their vocations, their practices, their businesses, to honor you, to represent you well in their place of calling. Thank you for them. What a noble, what a noble gathering of people, and I'm so grateful. And thank you for each one of them. Lord, help us to ratchet up a bit our sensitivity, our prayer, our availability to those around us who may be opportunities that you have placed before us to share the truth of God's grace in Jesus and help us to do that. Recognizing that just a handful of people is not what's important. What's important is that that handful of people be who you've called us to be. So Paul's going to journey, a long journey now. He's going to change everything about his life and ministry. What it will not change is his determination to be what you want him to be in each of those places and along the way. And may that be an encouragement to us as well today. We thank you for that. Thank you for helping us this morning. This is the time change and the challenge of that. Thank you for our time of worship. Thank you for speaking to us. Bless the remainder of our day. Make it holy. Strengthen, refresh, and restore us in it. Ready us to hit the pavement full and alive in you, we pray. Bless our time around your table now. Feed us, strengthen us, nourish us. May we leave with our hearts and souls overflowing. Precious Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name.